Hi, this is Eric Durek and welcome to this edition of Med Health Fit, the TV show that integrates wellness and healthcare. And we are in part three of our program on working well, which is the use of wellness, exercise, and integrative medicine to help with workers who are undergoing any type of workers' compensation issue. It's a big deal. Well, in our first two programs, we talked a little bit about how the workers' comp system worked and a little bit about how the wellness system integrates into that. And for this section right here, we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper in terms of musculoskeletal injuries and some exercise programs, and we're just gonna define some of these things in a little bit more detail. So in this chapter, kind of, kind of scary here, talking about personal responsibility issues. And a lot of people who have accidents and injuries in the working situation uh, has a lot to do with what we call personal responsibility and what I actually call the lazy factor. And that's not lazy in the fact that someone is just a lazy slob and they shouldn't be working. That's not the point at all. The point is, is that when someone really gets good at their jobs, they have a tendency not to think about it as much as they do uh, when they're first learning it. So in other words, they're not at such a heightened state of awareness because they, they got good. They got good at what they're doing. So the lazy factor is in the sense that people uh, they maybe not clean up the water on the floor. Uh, they, they don't double check certain types of things. They don't tighten something as, as correctly as they should because they're going on to another thing. Uh, most accidents happen when people uh, are trying to hurry with certain types of things. And usually it's because of the lazy factor. Oh, that'll just, that'll work. I got to get on to the next thing boom, they got hurt. So what we're going to try to do with this, this uh, chapter is we're going to talk about some of these issues that, that, that may contribute more to a person actually having uh, an injury at the workplace. And the first one is the fatigue factor. And everybody who's been watching TV in the past few years has been, has been um, really looking at these types of things about fatigue. And uh, in, in even in driver safety classes, people say, well, it's, it's alcoholism. People who are drunk drivers, that's the biggest cause of collisions. And they say, no, 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 it's people who text and drive, that's the worst cause of collisions. And what most people don't really know is that people who don't get enough sleep actually have almost twice the amount of accidents as people who are texting or drunk driving combined. And uh, we know that people who are fatigued, it's affecting all areas of work. Uh, whether they're you know, airline pilots or working in those types of stressful jobs, air traffic control, or people who are you know, doing groundskeeping. They're all important jobs, but some people are like, well, I, I don't need a lot of sleep for that. You know, I've got another job I gotta go to, et cetera. So fatigue is really one of the big things. Results from recent studies show that many workers who only get by of three to four hours of sleep during the night, and they will try without much success to recoup those hours of sleep during the work week. So there are a number of jobs where people are not even sleeping five or six hours, and that's very, uh, very problematic indeed. One of the other big uh, injuries in the workplace, and this is both in the industrial and also in the administrative, is carpal tunnel syndrome. And I remember being introduced to carpal tunnel syndrome by an author and friend of mine, Dr. Kate Montgomery, who invented the Montgomery method, which is a series of stretches and exercises for the wrists, so a person does not have to go and, and have surgery like we see here to get the median nerve released. Uh, very problematic, people who have this injury, you know, may have, they may develop certain secondary complications from that, um, like, you know, buildup of scar tissue, et cetera. So the Montgomery method just uses a series of self-massage techniques and certain types of stretches that are performed on a regular basis to really help keep the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, et cetera, in the wrist as strong as possible. So if you're typing, your word processing, you can do that for longer periods of time. Or if you're working in the industrial setting, swinging a hammer or, or lifting heavier things with the wrist uh, you know, on longer periods of time, your body's strong enough and can recover well enough so you don't have to uh, develop some of these symptoms of carpal tunnel. And I think that exercise and flexibility on a regular basis play an, a hugely important aspect. Uh, you know, I've worked with people in the work setting and we've done stretching programs for them three or four times a week and the incidence rate of carpal tunnel went down from five or six a year down to zero. And there are certain years where we didn't have any carpal tunnel. So it's been, it's been very uh, rewarding to see the effects of exercise, stretching, um, 
range of motion things on on um, flat, on uh, the injuries. And this is this is some really beginning phases here. We we see this woman here who's just doing a praying position, and she's moving her hands up and down, and she's also stretching the wrists in a, in a hyperflexion and a hyperextensive type position. And if workers can do these stretches a couple times a day for probably 30 seconds an arm, uh, you'd be surprised how much prevention that you can have with just doing those types of stretches. Uh, intermediate phase, in addition to those regular st uh, st stretches, you can perform self-massage on the hands where you're actually just working the wrist right here, you know, at the wrist situation and you're moving up into the, into the forearm and you're working just stretching and moving the wrist on a regular basis. Uh, up and through here where you've got the muscles on either side of the thumb and here at the pinky and um, you can do this regular massage and I see actually people at my workplace do this all the time where they're doing self massage on the wrist and they're just trying to really get the circulation and the flexibility going with uh, both hands. The other one is an advanced phase you know for workers who use um, things like athletic tape and braces and you'll see this if you watch uh, certain things, uh, football games on Saturdays, or people who were track and field shot putters, they have a tendency to wrap their wrist a lot because they have a heavy object that they're going to be doing, you know, pushing with a great deal of force, or they might have a great deal of force on the wrist. You'll see this sometimes with basketball where they, where they will wrap one wrist, maybe their shooting hand. They do this to reduce pain and swelling. Uh, they want to keep it in a sort of a locked position. Um, and then usually afterwards, after they've done their particular movement series, they'll usually ice that area of the body. And for the wrist, you, they may just stick their whole their arm up to the elbow in an ice bath after their athletic uh, uh, you know, game or something, and they'll just keep it there and they'll reduce the inflammation from there. Uh, when we talk about post-rehab, we're talking for something like carpal tunnel, we're talking a program that they will do after their acute program for a long period of time. So let's look at this stretching program here. Now, you can do this on an acute phase, but if you want to do this on a, a, a daily stretches, one to two minutes, hyperextension, uh, daily wrist massage. Uh, if you've had carpal tunnel surgery, you want to do uh, some, um, a lot of um, massage on the surgical site, so you're really working on the scar tissue over time. And also what you're doing is you're increase, increasing the blood supply. Uh, in terms of exercises, um, a lot of people, are, they do wrist curls, like this woman here in the picture. She's doing it from a flex position and also from an extended position. So, uh, Michael, if you can show the camera here on my hand, um, what I'm actually doing here is I'm doing wrist curls, um, where the dumbbell would be up and then I'm turning the wrist over and I'm doing extensions through hyperextension and I would do that essentially on both wrists. I would do flexions and then I would do extensions. And those things are repeated five pound weights times 10, usually two sets, sometimes up to three sets depending how advanced it is. But you wanna make sure that you're doing the exercises in addition to the stretching and the massage. That would be where the advanced program comes in. In phase two, you're continuing with daily stretches and self-massage, but you're adding more of a progression to that initial weight training, and uh, you may actually have some people do some partner stretches with you as well. Uh, so you can do dumbbell presses, you can do bicep curls, you can do dumbbell rows, you can do a lot of things that are working both your back posture and you're doing a lot of gripping for the elbow. So if you're doing a pulling exercise, you're doing a pull down exercise, you're actually working not just the, the bigger muscles, but you're working the, the muscles in and around the wrist in a gripping situation. So you've got extra circulation and you've got uh, improvement in the ability of those muscles to contract. In phase three, you may want to perform exercises, not just that you've done in phase one and two, but now you're actually going to start doing whole body exercises like deadlift and row combinations. Uh, narrow grip pull downs and, and wide grip pull downs. So you're in this position and then you're in a wide grip position. So you actually are doing a number of different exercises. And remember, this is for someone with carpal tunnel syndrome, but they're doing whole body exercises in addition to the initial phase one and phase two programs where they just did massage, where they did stretching, and then they incorporated some very basic uh, strength training for the wrist muscles. Now we're starting to incorporate an entire whole body approach, which is pull downs, which is deadlifts, 
uh, which is going to be uh, work for the, what we call the kinetic chain, for the back muscles all the way down to the hamstrings, but you're gripping dumbbells or barbells in order to, to make those exercises happen. So when people say, well, today's my back day, well, it also may be your carpal tunnel recovery day because you're, you're gripping so much for those particular exercises. So let's move now from carpal tunnel to the back because as, as I've mentioned, back injuries are really the main exercise or the, the, the main uh, injury that most companies want to avoid. Most Americans have a back problem at least one point of their adult life. Um, however, most levels of pain can be avoided or reduced by having a good sound exercise program. And I may be the poster child for that because, uh, oh boy, probably 10, 15 years ago, I walked out into uh, my garage and I slipped. I did not fall, but I pinched some nerves uh, in the mid thoracic area of my back. If we can, Michael, you can check out the, uh, uh, right in here. Uh, right in the mid back area, I had just a tremendous amount of pain about a day after the, the, the slip and it lasted for about three days, very excruciating pain. Um, but I feel because I had done exercises, um, I was in a severe amount of pain for about three days, but uh, in a di I did not do any exercise. I actually did hydrotherapy, which was my main form of therapy. But in about four, four days or so, uh, my back pain was almost gone. And I, and I really attribute that not just to being in my late 30s, but also because I had good sound exercise program. General assessment. Most orthopedic doctors will take patients through bending and twisting assessments to see the level of mobility and to see the level of pain that they have. The range of motion is assessed sometimes by just having you move laterally, side to side, front and back, and then rotation, or they may actually put you on a machine that will measure those, not just from the range of motion, but the actual torque that you can that you can produce on that machine. So it will give you a number, and then as you heal, as you get stronger, as you get uh, better in your recovery process, they'll put you on the machine again and see where the torque and the range of motion are. And hopefully, both of those have improved. So tightness in back. I mean, almost everyone has tight back muscles once in a while. Uh, it's due to a lack of stretching, poor sitting habits, lack of exercise, and in some cases, you may have had a previous injury that's just not healing the way that it should. So stretching programs here, especially partner stretching, is I think um, fundamental in terms of working with tightness and balance of those back muscles. Um, an imbalance, you might have one leg that has good range of motion, but you might have another leg that, that's 10 degrees less. And you can say, well, I've got you know, pretty good flexibility, but not on both sides. So part of doing a post rehab program, as most trainers already know, is that you not only want to improve a person's flexibility, their range of motion, but you want to make sure that both legs, both arms, etc., cetera, uh, neck stretch on either side, they are all in balance in that they have almost the same range of motion, plus or minus probably less than a degree on both sides. Very important, rotation, extension, and flexion. Um, one of the big issues that people have had over the years is not just the scoliosis, but lordosis. And it has a lot to do with poor exercise and standing habits with children. And as they become adults, that lordosis or the sway back has a tendency to get worse over time. Uh, sometimes associated with a lot of back pain, and in some cases it causes the low back muscles to tighten and lose a lot of the muscle tonus. So this is where flexibility programs are very important. And if you went to a doctor, they would do, first off, they'd look at some pelvic tilts to see where you're having some problems with just the, the smaller muscles within the pelvis, and then lying down, bring the knees to the chest, either with both legs or single leg stretches. I think that those are two of the best both assessments and therapeutic and things that you can do for the low back for that phase one, just to make sure that you're increasing the range of motion, you're decreasing the pain levels in the, in the low back, and you're also trying to balance out both sides of the, of the uh, spine. <clears throat> All right, so here are just some basic exercises. I, I would hope that most um, even beginning level trainers understand these stretches, but now we're trying to apply them with people in the work comp setting to say, hey, how can we use this flexibility to get that person back on the job better 
than they were before. So the first stretch is just a hamstring stretch and the woman on the upper left has one leg tucked in and she's, she can do that obviously with both sides and you can, you can get a, uh, an assessment to see if there's more flexibility in one side. The upper right is what's called a cat stretch and you're usually doing this to stretch the, the back uh, the, you're doing a pelvic tilt down, you're doing a pelvic tilt up, and you can actually assess to see how much movement a person has in the back by doing this. And then the, the lower left is where the person would go into the hunch part of the cat stretch, where you actually can see how the roll is um, in the back. And then the lower right is basically a forward lunge where you're actually looking at both the pain levels and the flexibility of the hip flexors on both sides. So the person will put their hands on their hips, they'll stand up nice and straight, they'll do a forward lunge, and if they have any pain in one side or the other, you can actually measure that. Another good way to measure it without having a person stand is they'll lie on a table, they'll take one leg and they'll slide it off the table and they'll let it hang, and then you can measure that with some sort of a goniometry device to see how much uh, uh, ex uh, extension that they have in that hip and then you'll slide them over the other side of the table you'll have that leg hang down you can see what the extension is on the hip on that side as well so when you're looking at these these are very basic stretches that you want to do with someone you can do them over time you want to make sure that you can balance out both the legs and make, and the other thing is to make sure that they're pain free if you're doing it, all of these stretches either in combination or if you're only doing one of them the other thing is just basic posture and posture control. Uh, it can be performed by standing in a sitting posture. This comes from thinking tall. And I remember back in the day when I was a personal trainer, I would have someone, if they, were, if they wanted to think taller, I wouldn't have them just throw their shoulders back. I would have them actually think about what's happening in the solar plexus, which is right around the diaphragm area, and have them actually stand taller by lifting up on the rib cage. So let's let look at that again. So instead of being in this position, they're here and they're just lifting with the, with the rib cage and uh, they're, they're getting a better posture from that than they are just kind of throwing their, their hips back. And this is something that you can actually do with you have a very solid solar plexus. You can do this uh, while you're walking you know, down a hallway and um, it works very well. Um, so just lifting from the xiphoid process, which is a little bone right at the end of the sternum, and making sure that you're lifting from there. And um, second, by doing that, you create space for breathing. And one of the big things with aging uh, is that people, when, when they become more hunched over, when they have that kyphosis, they don't have as much lung capacity and their breathing actually can decrease year after year after year because they don't have the expansion in the rib cage in order to um, help them continue to breathe. So they are at greater risk for lung infections, they're at greater risk for, um, uh, in, uh, in, not influenza, but, but you know, um, fluid in the lungs, et cetera. And I really think that the standing posture is one of those things that can really help people from an aging standpoint, as well as um, reducing their, um, uh, their, their incidence of, of back injuries and back pain. So the other thing is sitting for long periods of time. There's a, there's a saying that's going all over the internet that sitting is the new smoking. I don't know how much about that that I agree with from the standpoint, you know, smoking is still the leading cause of premature death in the United States. But sitting for long periods of time in a number of different occupations is becoming very problematic. And especially with our computer technology where people who normally would use a typewriter for maybe a couple hours and then go do something else, they now find themselves using computers for 12, 13, 14 hours straight. Um, I remember looking at a, a workers' comp magazine about an injury of a person who was a computer programmer. And that person had uh, filed a claim for back pain, neck pain, and leg pain. And the cause of the pain was that they were sitting on the computer for up to 16 hours a day. I mean, they would get up and eat a little bit, maybe they'd go up and use the restroom, but other than that, they were on the computer, literally, for weeks at a time, for almost 16 hours a day. It was incredible. So, uh, if you're working at 12 hours a day with no breaks or movement, you have a, a better chance of having a problem. This may be one of the most common causes of back pain in general, and it's certainly 
uh, will not do well with your lordotic curve, probably will make it worse uh, in many cases. It will certainly is not going to make it any better. So sitting for long periods of time, the, the um, uh, information and advice that I give to people is if you're sitting at a computer or you're sitting in any type of job where you have a number of things that you're doing, it allows you to sit there, you have to put an alarm on your phone or have someone give you a call or something where you can get up every 45 minutes to an hour, go for a walk, do some stretches and get a little bit of that circulation going. You're going to be just as productive because you're not going to be having all of the pain that's going to be happening after just a couple hours in the chair. And that goes for my guys up there in the engineering room too. All right, so the last thing that we're going to talk about in this section is chronic intervention programs and how they're going to affect the worker. Well, nutrition is a, is a really big deal these days. We're talking about keto diets and paleo diets and, and things of that nature. And I've talked about that in a number of my other shows. We've had some great guests who have talked about different types of exercises for sports recovery, for uh, diabetes control for weight loss, etc. But more than anything, we eat. We eat two or three times a day. Some people eat more. And I don't know too many people that exercise three or four times a day. Some do, but most people, they don't. Uh, that's 21 meals a week, 85 meals a month, and almost 1,000 meals per year. That's not including snacks. So the, the, the big question is, if you're on the job, are you packing a lunch that you can bring to the office or do you go out and buy something? Well, this has been a big issue for people because 30, 40 years ago, most people went out for lunch and now a lot of people have very special diets that they're eating, whether it's higher protein or higher fat, uh, or they can't eat breads, which means they can't eat french fries, which means they can't eat other types of things in their meals. So. Many, in many people, the workplace, they have a tendency to skip lunch as it interferes with their workday. I don't agree with that because I think the body needs a certain level of consistency in terms of digesting food. And it's, it's going to help you not have highs and lows with your blood sugar. It's going to regulate your metabolism a little bit better. So having a snack and eating lunch at work, I totally agree with. I would like it to be a nutritious snack, not just a candy bar. Um, but a lot of uh, people are now starting to pack high quality proteins, uh, whether it's nuts and legumes, whether it's cheeses and meats and dairy products. Uh, they're packing this because, they're, they, because they've been reading about keto diets and paleo diets, which is higher protein and higher fat, which is actually a little bit better for the body. What most people didn't understand 30 years ago is that they thought eating fat was one of the worst things, and now we know that eating fat actually helps the brain, helps the, uh, regulate the blood sugar, and it helps the, the cells metabolically because mo all of your cells in your body have a layer of fat as part of their membrane. Is that eating good fats, avocados, uh, etc., uh, all of these things contribute to doing better at work because you're fueling the body with not as many calories and it's, it's actually harder to, to digest the fat than it is a carbohydrate. And I'm not saying people shouldn't eat those, but what, what I'm seeing in the, in the workplace, and I'm actually seeing this in certain commercials as well, is that they're actually uh, having like Planters Peanuts has got um, cheese and nuts in a little container. And this is, this is what they're selling to people for lunches and the yogurt companies, et cetera. They have a little carbohydrate in there, but they also have protein and fat. So I'm seeing that people, as part of their snacks and part of their lunch, they're trying to get more of the high quality proteins and fats in there just because they feel it, they, they're feeling better for longer periods of time and they're actually able to sort of monitor and regulate their body weight uh, much better than just having some um, um, you know, snacks, candy bars, those kinds of things. A note on organic food, and I know that I've spoken about this on a few of my shows before. Uh, a lot of people will not buy organic because it costs a lot of money. I don't agree with that. I would say that uh, there's a lot of misinformation about that. I think that, that purchasing organic foods, whether it's organic beef, chicken, fish, etc., is better for you in the long run. I think that it's a better cut of meat. I think it's been taken care of better. Uh, and if you're looking at fruits and vegetables, I always recommend to people, 
in as many of, especially our area, Southern California, that uh, they can buy from the farmer's market. And if not, go to the organic section of produce in your, in your store and see if you can buy that. Is it gonna cost a little bit more? It is, but again, I, I think in the long run it's better. Higher density of nutrients uh, based on organic products, better taste, that's another big plus, is you, if you buy organic and it tastes really good, you're probably gonna eat the whole thing, you're not gonna throw it out. Try to buy as much local produce uh, as possible or regional produce uh, from organic products and so you're actually supporting local and regional farms as opposed to these big uh, corporate farms. And I think that that's a really big aspect as well. I know that in one of my uh, recent shows, I interviewed someone who was the manager of a food co-op. And I think that that's also a good thing for people in your community to look for, uh, for your company as well. That may be a good incentive program for your staff that you can have uh, organic foods that are available to staff that they m might not buy on their own, but they can actually do a comparison based on how good this food tastes versus what they're usually buying for their own family. Uh, well, let's look at some of the numbers here. Very quickly, we're, we're coming to the close of our, of our segment here, but let's look at total cholesterol and triglycerides versus normal and versus high. And if you're really wanting to make changes in your nutritional health, you wanna aim for a cholesterol, obviously under 200, but you also wanna look at a good HDL uh, greater than 35 milligrams, and also triglycerides that are le way less than uh, 400, but hopefully normal levels under 200 milligrams per deciliter. So when you do your blood work, you wanna make sure that that's good. Um, and that's another thing that I'm gonna say, I think if, if for, for the ending part of this segment, is, and I've had many people on the show in terms of uh, blood levels and how important those things are. And I cannot stress to workers enough that at least once a year when they visit their doctor for their wellness program and their wellness checkup, that they have blood labs done and that those blood labs are explained to them as to how important they are for their work experience. Uh, I have to do this almost every year with people that I, that I work with who are not crazy about going to the doctor, but they need to have those, that blood work done. So that's part of the, the nutrition program as part of the workplace. And just judging by the music, I can see that uh, part three of the Working Well program is coming to a close. We still have a little bit more information on our next segment, but that'll be the last one. I appreciate you, the students, sticking with us here. This is important information on how we can actually help people in the workplace from their exercise, from their range of motion, from the nutritional aspect, from learning about how the system works and really communicating with the doctor. So in the last, por the last portion of Working Well, we'll wrap it up and we'll put all of these things together. So for part three of Working Well program, this is Eric Durack for MedHealthFit. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next segment.